The Intertech Group and the Zucker family are proud to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. Welcome to We the Women. This is our celebration of the 19th Amendment. Exactly 100 years ago, on August 18, 1920, the 19th Amendment was ratified giving women the right to vote. To celebrate, we'll be talking to women from around South Carolina, thought leaders, movers and shakers. We'll ask them about how they have used their voice and what they have done to contribute to our great democracy. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Sherry, for coming in to see us today and talk a little bit about um, the anniversary or remembering uh, 100 years of uh, women's right to vote. Um, you have quite an interesting uh, career and past um, in, in law um, and was hoping that we could jump right in and you could talk a little bit about your experiences um, when you were elected to the State House in 1970. It was eight days after your 21st birthday, I believe. Um, and at the time, you were the nation's youngest lawmaker. So what was that whole experience like? It was a very interesting experience. Uh, I think there are a couple things to note. One, at that time, the voting age was 21. So you had to be 21 to vote. I wasn't old enough to vote when I announced and became a candidate. And I was a junior at the University of South Carolina, junior in college. And the experience was uh, something just... I, I, it's not something I dreamed about. I didn't grow up hoping to one day run for office because women didn't run for office. So it wasn't something that I thought that I would do one day. But there were several factors that led to it. For one thing, I applied to be a page in the South Carolina Senate, and the clerk of the Senate at that time said over his dead body would there be women pages or female pages. So that and some other things caused me to think about why not run? And I ran, not really believing that I would win, but thinking that it was okay for young people to show that they were willing to go through proper channels to try to make a difference. The campaign was crazy. It didn't cost what it costs now to run for office. I think our budget was about $700 for the whole campaign. At that time, we did not have single member districts. People were elected from the county at large. And in the county, they elected three House members. And I was on the bottom of the three elected. And during the night of the election tallies, I went back and forth from third place to fourth place, third place to fourth place, but finally ended in third place and, and was elected. What was campaigning like at that time for you? Like what were, what were the issues that were, um, that people resonated with that ultimately got you elected? There were several different issues. One, there was a lot of campus unrest. So that's why the, the thought of trying to show that young people were willing to go through proper channels instead of demonstrating and burning and doing all of that, that was one of the issues. Education was an issue. That hasn't changed in 50 years. Education is still an issue. Campaigning meant going door to door. There wasn't a whole lot of TV or radio stuff at that point. We did do radio ads. I don't think we did TV ads that time. But the main thing was, I think people, because they could vote for three people, I think they were willing to take a chance on me. And even if they thought they were throwing away a vote, they were willing to throw away one. Had we had single member districts at the time, I probably wouldn't have been elected. The, uh, there were six candidates running. The other five, of course, were male. All were over 30 and all had run for office before. So it was an interesting campaign. What was uh, the first day in Columbia like? It was a zoo. <laughs> I, w I was pretty quiet. My dad had been in politics and he said, just remember, you don't learn anything when you're talking. You only learn when you're listening. And I had a lot of listening to do. What was um, what were some of the notable things that you had worked on during uh, two terms, correct? Two terms in the House, yes. Uh, one was making buildings accessible to handicapped people. And we got people in wheelchairs. We got legislators to go out in wheelchairs or crutches and try to get over the, side, the curb on the sidewalk and do things like that. It was a struggle, but 
but we made it, and I was glad to see that we got that through. Also introduced something unsuccessfully to ban smoking in public places. I know that sounds crazy now, but 50 years ago, members of the House and Senate smoked in the chamber. I mean, it was, it was smoke everywhere. And the old saying about smoke-filled rooms, there was a reason that saying came about. It's because the rooms were smoke-filled. We were not successful in getting that passed the first time. It took a while. How do you feel your experience um, serving then was different than uh, the male companions that you had serving at that time as well? Absolutely, absolutely. There were only two women in the house. And it, it was hard to work on, a lot of people work on legislation after hours, they get together, they play golf, they play tennis, they do whatever, but women didn't do that. So there was no organization, there was no women's caucus, there was no Republican caucus. I happened to be elected as a Republican, and there were only five Republicans in the House. So I was a minority by age, by party, and by gender. It was, it was difficult. There was, there was just a different atmosphere then. People weren't used to women being in office. They weren't used to young people. How, what kept you motivated? I'm not sure what kept me motivated. I stayed motivated. I wanted to keep trying and I was determined to do a good job. I knew that there were a lot of eyes on me and I was determined to do a good job, do the best that I could do. Who was the other, you said there was a, one other woman that was serving at that time? It was Carolyn Frederick from Greenville. Gotcha. Did you guys connect or? Um, oh yeah, comments? yeah. What were, what were some of those experiences that you think you shared that was different than what male counterparts? Well, a lot of times back then, people talked about women's issues Whereas Carolyn and I both felt that all issues were women's issues. They weren't just women. People thought that child care was a women's issue, which should be everybody's issue. Taxes, they thought, were men's issues. Taxes are everybody's issue. So there were all kinds of things that she and I talked about. We did a lot on education together. But pretty much I was, inter I was just as interested in the budget as anybody else in the legislature. Mm -hmm. wow. And like day to day, what was it like for you, like interacting with the men or I guess older men too um, at that point? Was there a lot of like young lady type talk or, um, you know, you sit down, handle this? Kind of uh, no, I tell you one of the most interesting stories. Senator Edgar Brown was in the Senate at the time and he was, I don't know, in his 80s, I guess, and he'd missed part of the legislative session because of ill health. And we had a joint session one day. Had a, I don't remember what it was. Maybe the governor was speaking. I, I don't remember the issue. But I walked by the desk where he was sitting, and he said, hey, when they allow girl pages in here, I said, I'm, I'm a member of the House. He said, you are, <laughs> he didn't even realize because he'd been sort of out of touch. It, was it intimidating to, like at first, or did it, like, did it slowly become normal and feel more confident? I mean, how did you like mentally prepare day to day for this? I was scared to death. I mean, I was scared to death when I, the night of the election, when I won, I thought, oh my gosh, what in the world am I going to do now? I wasn't prepared to win. And I don't know if you ever saw a movie called The President. I think it was Ronald, not Ronald Reagan, uh, Robert Redford ran for office. And after he won, he sat down on the bed in the, sat down on the bed in the hospital, I can't even talk today, in the hotel and said, I won. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And I think that's the feeling I had. And it was intimidating because there was a lot of press attention. And I think I was watched more carefully. I was watched about what I said, what I did, what I wore, everything. Things, things that shouldn't make a difference seem to make a difference. But yes, it was intimidating. And I would always called older people Mr. Well, in this case, Mr. because it's mostly men. And trying to talk to them on a first name basis was an odd feeling for me.
and kind of like a power power play to equalize things out, right? Right. One of the first time, one of the first few days, one of the members of the house brought an apron and presented it to me. Said, "That's what I should be wearing." So, I mean, that kind of stuff happened. Wow. And at the same time, so you were a junior in college at this time. Yes. So, how did you balance that with with school? Did you drop out? Or? I didn't drop out. I reduced my course load. But one thing, right after I announced that I was running, the next day in one of our classes, the professor said, well, it looks like one of our class members has decided to run for office. He said, how about go up to the front of the room and let us a ask you questions? And they put me on the spot and asked all kinds of questions, but it was a good experience. They grilled me, but it prepared me for things coming. What was like door knocking like and what, did you guys do debates and that kind of stuff as well? We had we did not do debates. We had speaking engagements. They weren't really debates, but door knocking was going out and going door to door and knocking and asking for votes. How was that experience? It was it was interesting again because there were people say, oh, yeah, I heard about you. I don't know. I just don't know if I can vote for somebody young. I don't know if I can vote for a woman. Then I found a lot of people who said, I'm proud of you. Go for it. Yeah. All kinds of reactions. All kinds of reactions. Wow. Um, now kind of switching gears, I was hoping to talk a little bit about you were a delegate in 1972 and 1976 for the National Republican Conventions. Right. Um, t tell me about those experiences. Okay, well, 72 National Convention was a time of unrest still. And interestingly, we, the delegates stayed at a hotel and we rode a bus to the convention center together. And some of the protesters put a potato in the uh, tailpipe and we had problems with the bus going to the convention center. And we weren't sure we were going to make it. But it was interesting, too. I served on the Rules Committee. Each state had one male and one female on the Rules Committee, and I served on that, both conventions, 72 and 76. And that, that was a great experience. What did that entail? It entailed deciding rules for the convention. For example, in 76, one of the big issues was whether a candidate for president had to select his running mate or announce his running mate before the convention. And that would be a rules change. And that was the most controversial one. How did you guys navigate through that? It was bitter. It was bitter. How so? <laughs> because there were a lot of people who said, no, they've got to decide who the, they've got to let us know who their candidate would be for vice president. And they were adamant about it. And there were others who said, you know, this is the way it's been for years. If you're going to change it, change it for four years from now, but don't change it right now when we're right at the convention. What, and you guys ultimately decided? Uh, the candidate did not have to name his running mate prior to the convention. What, you know, for people who haven't been to a convention before, what is that atmosphere and experience like? You can hear more about the speeches on television than you can in person because there's a lot of noise, people walking around, shaking hands, campaigning, asking, I mean, just chit chat all over the place. So it was hard to hear speakers. When the president or the candidate for president spoke, everybody got pretty quiet. But all the other speeches, they were very difficult to hear. It was like a big, like a big party celebration. Yes, like yes. Like, I'm guessing lots of red, white, and blue. Um, outfits and, and such like that. Balloons everywhere, pins, badges, hats with little pins all over them, just all kinds of things. When you were there, how how were women represented there? There were a good many women delegates because the parties, I think both parties tried with their different committees to be sure they had one female and one male, one female, one male for every committee. There were still more men than women, but for for the delegates, but for committees, it was an equal balance. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, now, uh, kind of shifting gears again, um, you were, I, I don't have the year with me, but you were also elected to serve in the state senate. 
That's right. What year was that? That was 1987, and the reason it was an odd year, it was right after Arthur Ravenel was elected to Congress, so there had to be a special election to fill his Senate seat. He'd, he'd been in the state Senate. So that's why it was an off year. Gotcha, gotcha. And interestingly enough, you served at the same time your father was also serving. Yes. How, how, did, how was that experience? It was an amazing experience. I look back, I lost my dad in 2001, and I look back, and I now as a parent of adult children, I know that he was very proud. I didn't like being treated like his little girl. A lot of times, some of the senators would go over to him and say, how about I ask Sherry if she'll do such and such and such, or if she'll vote such and such? And it upset me that they wouldn't ask me there still weren't as many women in 1987 and 1988 as there are now. So it was it was still a new experience for the men as well. Do you think that learning curve for, for men in public office has caught up at all? or For some, for some, for some because there are more women and, and it, it's something they have to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, so that was something that you experienced a lot of was someone going to your dad asking to ask you yeah, things like voting for judges. How about ask Sherry if she'll vote for such and such for judge? And it, my dad was usually, hey, I'm passing this along. Somebody asked, would you do such and such? But he never pressured me to do it. And in fact, we voted, uh, we didn't always vote alike on issues because we were representing different areas. And some things varied as far as the interest. What the district that he represented something may have been good for, but not necessarily the best for the district I represented. What were some of those issues that you guys, did you guys ever like really butt heads or was it cordial? Oh, it was always cordial, always cordial. In fact, the Senate in general was rather cordial. Gotcha. What were some of those things that you guys differed on? The accommodations tax, uh, whether that was that was one of the major things. Right now, I don't remember others. There were there were some, but that was that was the big one. Where did you guys fall on the issue? Well, one of my neighbors at home used to say that my dad was robbing Peter to pay Paul with the accommodations tax, and I was not in that category. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, even day to day, what was it like? Like, were you, you guys weren't living near each other at that time, right? No, I was living in Mount Pleasant. He was living in Lexington. But we sh we had an office. It, two senators share an office, or an office suite. And we were suite mates. So he had an office, I had an office, and in the middle was the open area. But that didn't mean that we saw a lot of each other in the office. We saw more of each other on the floor of the Senate than we did in the office. And we sat next to each other for a while. What was that like? Um, it, it was really interesting in that sometimes he'd say, you've got on too much perfume today and things like that. But he was, st he was a fellow senator, but he was still dead. Just the good, gentle ribbings that... Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Absolutely. Gotcha. Um, wow. So, reflecting on your service, um, you know, uh, in the community and uh, the state house. What are, are there a few things that stand out for you that you're most proud of? Yes, and that's gonna be a, a strange thing to answer. While I was in the Senate, I read to a class of elementary students every week, and it continued, I did it for eight years. And one day I was checking out somewhere and writing a check, and the woman at the cash register said, oh, I know you. Well, I expected her to say, you're the senator. She said, you're the one that reads to my granddaughter every week. That probably meant more to me than anything anybody ever said to me because I think reading to children is so important and that makes more of a difference in a child's life than anything else you can do. So that wasn't really a Senate duty, but that was something that happened during that time that really made me feel great, gave me warm fuzzies inside. We, um, I authored a bill to allow students with disabilities to take their exit exams or high school exams in a different way than what is ordinary. 
Some students need extra time, some need extra uh, formats and authored that and that went through. It took a lot to get it through, but it did go through. And that's one of the things I'm proud of. It sounds like you focus a lot on education and you had brought up that you had worked with uh, the other woman in the house to work on education. Um, what are some areas that you'd like to see improve today for the state education? Well, I'd like to see more funding for education. I'd like to see class sizes reduced. Even though when I went to school, we had 40-something students in a classroom, that doesn't mean that it was the best thing in the world. The teachers did a great job back then, but I think teachers are underappreciated. They're underpaid. Teachers are really the backbone of society. They, they make such a difference in what's going to happen in the future. Now, what has been the most challenging experience for you? You've listed a few things that I think anyone would say that's got to be the most challenging thing. But is anything jump out as like a something that you're proud that you overcame? Yes. Um, when I was in the Senate, I was nominated by the governor to be a workers' comp commissioner for the state. And there was a lot of battling about that. It was supposed to be confirmed by the Senate, and it was going to be a close, close vote. There were a lot of people said, oh, no, she doesn't have heart. She can't do it, da, 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 da. And it was a close vote, but I did make it and ended up serving for 12 years as a workers' comp commissioner for the state. That was a personal battle for me, and and it worked out okay. It, it was something that I had to live through, but it was... We had executive sessions then to, to approve nominees, and there was a lot of name calling, a lot of backstabbing, and made it through. What is, what is the responsibilities of someone that serves on workers' comp? A workers' comp commissioner travels the state and serves pretty much as a judge. It's a quasi-judicial position. So I heard cases of injured workers from across the state had to make decisions on whether they were awarded benefits, how many, and what kind of medical attention they got. And it was a, it took a lot of work, a lot of reading, a lot of studying, but it was certainly a great experience and one that I'm glad I had. Probably some tough things to hear about people with injuries and um, trying to make ends meet. I'm sure that was taxing to... It, it's really something that I learned a lot about. When I went there, what I heard from people was they fake injuries just trying to get money. They fake injuries just trying to get money. That was not the case. There were some who exaggerated. There were some who did fake injuries, I think. But overwhelmingly, there were people who were truly injured, who wanted to go back to work, who wanted to get medical care so they could go back to work, so they physically could work. And my opinion changed a lot. My stance on that changed a lot hearing the cases. I, there were some really tragic cases. I heard death cases, uh, just minor injury cases. And minor injury sort of depends. If, if you're a keyboard person, losing a finger is not a minor thing. If you are a dance teacher and you dance with your feet, then the finger loss is not as crucial where do you think the state of workers' comp commission is today? I think it's moving forward. It's There was a big backlog at the time over the 12 years, but I think they have picked up on that a good bit, and I, I think it's going forward as it should. There, Nobody ever likes, no two sides are ever happy with an outcome. It's just about the same any case that goes to a court Somebody wins, somebody loses, but depends on how big the loss is as to whether they're happy. Now, um, the reason we're talking today is to reflect on the 100 years since uh, ratification of women's rights. And let's be clear, I don't remember 100 years ago. <laughs> um, well, just kind of reflecting on, you know, where um, things have, have come for women and where things need to go. Um, where do, What do you think of the current state of of things for women, of, of quality of life for women? Well, first of all, I cannot imagine being alive at a time that women were not allowed to vote. I did, that's just something I can't fathom, and I'm so proud of and appreciative of the women who fought for that. 
that, that was a battle that I'm so glad was fought before I was around. There's still a lot to be done. I mean, the women's numbers have increased greatly in elective office, not enough. That doesn't mean I think there ought to be a quota saying <clears throat> X number of women ought to be in the legislature. You can't do that. But I think people, the voters are more accepting of female candidates. Female candidates are more comfortable now than they were years ago. There are a lot of women who said, I don't think I can do that and do everything else too. And I think people have come to realize it's a battle, but you can do, you can have the balance you need. What do you think has led to that change, to that increase in women getting involved in this way? I think women asserting themselves has led to a change. Uh, women seeing, hey, yes, that is something I can do. I think as opposed to when I grew up, I think there are girls now who grow up thinking, one day I might like to be president or one day I might like to be governor. When I was growing up, that was not something I thought about because women just did not do that. So I think we're generationally we're changing. It shouldn't take as long as it does. Or has, but it does. It, it it takes time for these these kinds of things to change. What would you like to see more for women? I think fundraising for women has been a difficult thing. That was one of the things I faced when I ran my first campaign, and it's one of the things I faced in every campaign after that. People are are the corporations or individuals or anybody else contributing to campaign not quite as willing to give to female candidates unless they've already been elected as they are to male candidates. Um, and I guess one of my last questions for you is, uh, what advice do you have for women who think about, who might be considering politics or going into, um, you know, running for an election, serving on a campaign? Oh, for running for office, I would say if a woman is interested, do it. You've got to be willing to lose if you're going to run. I mean, that's not everybody's going to win, but you'll never win if you don't try. That's just, that's the big thing. Women can make a difference. Women seem to be more outspoken than men and more direct than men on a lot of issues and in serving in office. And I think that's an important contribution women can make to the elective process and to government in general. And for any woman thinking about it, I say do it just do it. Campaigning is um, not easy. I've heard of a few politicians who say, I love campaigning. I don't think campaigning is something that's fun to do. It's hard work, but serving is worth it. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.